Good morning to everyone and welcome to this worship service, First United Methodist Church in Hammond. We welcome you for those that are watching online and hope that you enjoy this morning, this worship service. I am Pete Ward. I'm the retired pastor in the United Methodist uh, Conference, uh, and it is my honor to be with you this morning as Pastor Chris uh, continues his vacation. Uh, and simply ask that you continue to lift up Chris and his family uh, as he is enjoying some well-earned rest. A couple of announcements we want to make sure that you are aware of. There is a, uh, an easel out in the, in the Narthex area there with the sign-up sheet on September 17th. Saturday, September 17th, there is the party in the parking lot as this church attempts to reach out into the neighborhood. Uh, and to let them see what the hands and feet of Jesus is all about. And so we encourage you to, one, put that date on your calendar to participate it in, but also for those that are gathered here and online, we can, yeah, if you're interested in serving, let us know. We can figure out a way to help uh, that make that happen. But there is a sign-up sheet there for various activities that need your participation uh, in order to make this a, a very effective and wonderful event. It will take all of us. Uh, as the hands and feet of Jesus to make that happen. So uh, mark that date, Saturday, September 17th. Tomorrow night, Monday, uh, at 7 o'clock, there will be an organizational meeting. Uh, and and I don't, let's see if I, I'm not sure which room that's going to be in, but there will be an organizational meeting to help organize and put that together. So if you're interested in that, um, make sure tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, you're here at the church as well. The other item that I want to lift up to you is an item we lifted up last week. Pauline Luthi had put together a list. Uh, again, one of the items that this church, is, one of the organizations that this church said that they were going to support uh, as a mission project was Wallace School. And there is a, uh, an eight and a half by 11 sheet that Pauline Luthi has put together. It should be out on the church's website as uh, the items that Wallace School needs. Uh, if you are interested in that and, and need to get that list, let the office know. We can get that list to you. Uh, on the uh, altar rails, there is just a small sample of the items that have already been provided. There is a, uh, a container out in the corner where the missions uh, uh, corner is at uh, with additional items in there. But there are a lot of items that need to be purchased from tissues and pencils and colors and scissors and erasers uh, and notebook pads, uh, et cetera. Uh, again, it is a mission project that this church has adapt, adopted uh, to support. And so I encourage you to, uh, to look at that, look at the supply needs, uh, and, and help support that project as best you can. A little, while, a little later in the service, we'll get to our prayer concerns. We'll draw those attentions to those that we need. There is a list of uh, those families, those individuals in the back of the bulletin that will need to be lifted up in our prayers. Again, we welcome you. We welcome those gathered here and in person. And as the custom of this church uh, to begin our worship service, there is a call to worship that begins with this. I say to you, O Lord, open our lips. And your response is, and we shall declare your praise. And we will repeat that three times. So join me in our call to worship there. O Lord, open our lips. O Lord, open our lips. O Lord, open our lips. And I'm going to invite you now to unite our voices together in a slide that we put together for our call to worship. In the midst of trouble and turmoil, God is our refuge. In God's strength, we shall be healed. Come, let us worship God, grateful for God's wondrous power. May I invite you all to stand as you are able and join in our opening hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
please bow your heads in prayer. Great healer, make us aware of your great spirit here in this place. Touch and heal our brokenness and lift us out of despair and doubt. Dry our tears of pain and sorrow. Comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your great love, O oh God. May we flourish and blossom in the warmth and compassion of your healing love and grace. Amen. You may be seated. And at this point, I'm going to ask that the children come forward for the children's message. Good morning. Boy, it's so nice to see you guys. Okay, at first it looked like we were gonna have a rainy day, but the sun came out. At least it's peeking out a little. So this morning we have Emma returning and Emma is going to talk about how we can be better together. So, Emma and her friends were playing, and she realized that there were five seasons in the year. Do you know what those five seasons are? Ah, Sammy thinks he knows four of them. What are four of them? Let, tell us. Winter, spring, fall, and summer. Okay, does anybody know what the fifth one is? Okay, scratch your head. It's back to school season. The fifth season of the year. Summer is over and it's time to get back to work. And you know the best part of all? Is now you get to be with your friends. Maybe you saw your friends every now and then during the summer, but now you can see them every day. Isn't that great? And guess what? You're going to find some new people there, too. You're going where to go to school? The kid. All right. Um, there's there's uh, two people new at my school. There are two people new at your school? And it's kind of neat meeting new people, but also it can be a little awkward because, you know, sometimes we find that people are a little bit different from us, right? And some kids are better at some things than other. What are some of the things you're good at? Math. You're good at math. I loved math when I was in school. I used to take math classes for fun. Can you believe that? For fun. Talk about a geeky kid. Reading. You like reading. I like that too. Do you have something favorite that you like to do? Oh, she likes to read too. So that's fantastic. Well, Jesus wants us to live in a community. And you go with your mama, that's wonderful. Well, Jesus wants us to be a community of faith. And in that community of faith, we all have individual differences. We're not the same. Sammy's good at math. I bet you you're good in sports, too, aren't you? What are you good at? Baseball and football. Excellent. You like what? I play basketball. Oh, I like that. Basketball. I was good at jump rope. I could even do double dutch. Yeah. How about you? You like to run. Okay, nothing wrong with that. That's a lot of fun, too. Oh, my, mommy doesn't like swinging? 
Oh, okay, I understand. See, we all have our individual differences. And it's just like, look at this. I got a bunch of stuff up here. Just a bunch of stuff. And on its own, it just looks like, uh, but if you put it together, like God puts us together in a community of faith, we can make something special. Now here, I have a vase. Let's call this vase God. God's gonna be our vessel, okay? So then we have some rocks. We've got some rocks here. Sam, will you pour those rocks in my vase? We're going, we're going to call these rocks Pastor Chris. And he contributes to our, our um, community of faith because he's, he's pretty good at preaching. Uh, I think we got them all. One stuck in the bag. Okay, now I've got these. These are little lights. Wow, I've got four sets of these little lights. Let's call these little lights our ushers. Can I turn one? You want to turn one on? Oh my goodness, let's do it. All right, you're pretty cool. You gonna put it in there? All right. Got it? All the way down, down deep. Okay, you want to get this one? And Sammy, see, I got four of them. Okay. Okay, toss it in there. What are we going to do with the other things then? Okay, now these lights represent our ushers. Pretty cool, huh? So now, next we have a plate. We're, we're going to call our plate, and forgive me, but our plate is going to be Miss Sarah. Because Miss Sarah makes it just a little bit neater to have worship services on Sunday. Because she puts up all these neat pictures and she makes sure that we can hear people when they're talking. So thank you, Miss Sarah. And then we have a bowl we're going to put on top. We'll call that the congregation. And let's add a little bit of ribbon. Why add ribbon? Can you hold this for me? Okay, hold that for me. Gonna add a little bit of ribbon. That's a lot. Huh? You think that's a lot of ribbon? Yeah. She don't okay. get to get not too much. Okay. Not too far. Okay, a little bit of ribbon. And if we add some goodies to it. No, stay back, stay back. There you go. Add some goodies to it. And we're going to call these goodies our children. The children of our church. We've built a pretty neat community of faith. And that's what God does with us. When God puts us all together, we become a beautiful vessel of faith. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Yes, you may eat those. If either of them falls down, then one should help the other up. And that's what God means when he talks about our community of faith. Okay, can we pray together? Repeat after me, dear God. Thank you for your love for me. And thank you for all of the people in my life that shared with me. Please help me to see how I can share with others too. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and please take a treat with you.
Please stand as you're able. Join in a prayer of him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. As we go into a time of prayer, there's a list on the back of the bulletin of the, those individuals and those families that need our prayer concerns. We lift those individuals up, not because God needs to know their names, because he already does, and he knows what that situation is, what is needed for that healing. But we lift those individuals up for ourselves so that we can remind each other that we are in this together and that we need all of us to be praying for one another. If you are online and you have a prayer need, we invite you to use the comment section. We have people who will be watching that, and we would love to get those prayer concerns out to our individual people as well, to lift them up as we go into our daily prayers during the week, that we could take your concerns as well as those that we have listed in the bulletin. Prayer concern that was added uh, is from Rosalie Harrington and a prayer concern for her daughter-in-law, Michelle, that has had COVID for uh, over two weeks now, uh, and the doctors are struggling on how to deal with that. So that is uh, Michelle, that's Rosalie Harrington's daughter-in-law. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we are so bound by rules and regulations that we fail to see the human need that goes beyond the bounds of structures. We easily relegate compassionate service to those agencies in our society that have that as their mandate, forgetting that you have given us that supreme mandate to care for one another, even as you have cared for us. We turn our backs on those in need, giving the responsibility to someone else. We think or say out loud, let someone else do the work. And in that proclamation, we have revealed our selfishness and our inability to be your disciples. Almighty God, stop us from our selfish ways. Heal our hardened hearts. Forgive us again as you, as we have so often asked. 
before those many times that we have failed to be your witnesses. So God, as the summer is almost over, and we wonder where the time went. We look at the plans that we had, those that we accomplished, and, and then those that are now to be put aside for another time. We look ahead to the busy year of witness and service that is available to us right now. We may ask the question if we are ready to truly work for you. Yeah, that rest that we craved at the beginning of summer now seems to have slipped away. It leaves us breathlessly facing the upcoming autumn season. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us feel your strengthening presence within us. Help us to place our trust in you, knowing that you will empower and enable us to be in service. Help us to become involved in ministries of peace and justice right where we are. For there is nowhere in creation where your love is not needed. And so give us the strength to proclaim with loud voices messages of love and hope to all people. And so God, as we worship today, we bring you our offerings, but we also bring you ourselves, and now we bring you these prayer concerns. You know those needs. You know those individuals and those families. You know all those that are listed on the back of our bulletin. Lord God, we simply pray for your healing touch. And we pray that you would give us wisdom on how that touch manifests itself. We especially lift up to you, Michelle, suffering from this dreaded COVID. Lord God, we know so many have suffered from that. So many have perished. And yet, it still rears its ugly head around us time and time again. Wrap your, your healing arms around Michelle. Healer as only you can. And, and wrap your arms around Rosalie and that his whole extended family. Give them a sense of peace and calmness that only comes from the relationship they have with you. Lord God, we know there are so many others suffering from COVID. We pray for those as well. We pray for our medical professionals, the first responders that have to deal with this day in and day out. But God, we pray, Juan, that you would protect them. But we also pray that, that you would be with them as they continue to do their jobs. Give them the wisdom to treat this disease. Look, God, we lift up to you all those that will be going into the, for medical help, whether it's surgery or whatever that need is. Pray that for those that will be having surgery, they be with the doctors and nurses, that you would guide their hands, their minds, the decisions they make. That those surgeries would be successful and those loved ones would be back with their loved families as soon as possible. Lord God, we live in a nation that is still struggling to find itself. Divisions in so many places. Remind us once again that we are your people that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we pray for our leaders at all levels of government. Pray that you would guide them in the decisions that they make. That those decisions would be decisions that help all of us. We lift up to you, the young men and women of our armed forces. We give you thanks for their service and we ask for their protection as only you can provide. Lord God, we know that there are those gathered here and online watching that have particular prayer needs. And in the silence of a moment, we let those individuals bring those prayer concerns to you. We simply take time to listen for your voice. Lord 
Lord God, as we bring these prayer requests to you, names, concerns of those who are dear to us, as we speak them out loud, as we whisper them in the silence of this service, we seek your healing, compassionate love. Let us also be willing to place our needs and our own concerns before you, that you would give us a powerful sense of restoration and reconciliation. Lord God, we ask all these things in the mighty name of your Son, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus, the risen Christ, who taught us to pray with these words, saying, and I invite you to join with me in our Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for the morning comes from Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. When he saw her, Jesus called her to him and said, woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hands on her and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath responded, there are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord replied, hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get water? Then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame. But all those in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. We are continuing so to speak, with the Gospel of Luke. And if you were here last week or you were watching online, you may remember some of what we talked about last week. And, and, the, and the scripture was one of those scriptures that I said was, was sometimes difficult to hear, uh, more difficult to really understand because Jesus made these comments that he was here to bring division, you know, to separate families, to, to cause this division between families. And, but when we, when we took that scripture apart and tried to really look at it, what we came to the conclusion was that it wasn't so much the division that Jesus was talking about as it was that we need to do something different. And that we would need to maybe tear down, even light the fire, if you will, in order to refine, in order to put something back together that would be different and that would work better because things are not the way that Jesus envisioned them. And so we want to continue that dialogue in, in Luke with this scripture of this woman who for 18 long years was disabled. 18 long years bent over. Now, the first thing we want to look at is, look at is the number 18, because in, in Jewish 
numbers, that number in Judaism, that number is important. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, each letter has a numerical value. And so it's, if, we, if we start to tear this apart a little bit, the number 10 in Judaism is the letter what we would call U, a Y-U-D, Yud, Yud. And the number eight in Judaism is the letters H-E-T, but we pronounce it, Judaism pronounces it Chi, or actually Hi, like, that looks like C-H-A-I, but it's actually pronounced Hi. And the meaning of that is life. So a common phrase in Judaism is El Hai. El Hai means to life, to life. It's a phrase that is often spoken in celebrations when good things are going to come. And so 18 years would have meant something different to this woman because her 18 years was filled with misery with 18 years of what we're told of being bent over. And so this life, this El Hai, this, this toast to life, was about to take on a different meaning for her. And understand that the people that Jesus was talking to would have understood that. They would have understood the meaning of that number 18. They would have recognized it in the story that something different was about to happen. Something important was about to happen. Something that had to do with life. Something was going to change the life of this woman. And understand in this scripture how Jesus is paying attention. Because this woman did not come to him. Jesus was watching and saw her. The woman did not have to do anything. The scripture tells us that Jesus was preaching in the synagogue. And this woman with a serious health problem shows up. A woman who was quite unable to stand up straight. It was Jesus who noticed her. It was Jesus that responded with grace, who responded with compassion. She didn't ask to be healed. She didn't ask to be healed. Jesus recognized her problem, the pain that she was in. It was Jesus that simply said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. He lays hands on her and she immediately straightens up and begins praising God. Now, over, over time, over the centuries, Christians, Christians have read this passage over and over and, and reading it as a, a passage of healing on the Sabbath, if you will, and, and determined that is a, this is in direct criticism of Judaism. The, the Sabbath custom that, that radical Jesus loved breaking. In fact, Christians who have looked at this passage have, have decided that it is proof that Jesus came to tell all those Jews that it's time to break the rules to lighten up, to not be such sticklers for these rigid rules. And, and so if, if, we, if we read this scripture with that thought process in mind, 
We might hear the response of the synagogue leader in a different light. We, we might hear him speaking indignantly because of what Jesus had done. We might hear him speaking how Jesus had broken the Sabbath law, that how Jesus had violated the Sabbath. But if we read it more carefully, and we listen to those words, the crowd, the crowd watching and listening gets it right. Because if you go back and look at those words again at the back of the scripture, it's the crowd that understands what Jesus is doing. Luke tries to point that out, and you know, our scholars have said that it is common belief that Luke himself was a physician. And so Luke writes, writes these words, the entire crowd is rejoicing about the wonderful things that Jesus had done. The crowd's not upset at Jesus. The crowd didn't think that he had violated the Sabbath. In fact, they react as if this response of the synagogue leader is nothing more than his attempt to find fault with Jesus, to criticize Jesus, to bring him under the scrutiny of the synagogue leaders. And so the question we ask ourselves, was Jesus breaking the Sabbath? Was Jesus violating the Sabbath by providing this healing? One of the the New Testament scholars uh, that at one time taught at Vanderbilt Divinity School is a Jewish woman by the name of Amy Jill Levine. And she writes a book called The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus. And in that particular book, she deals with this scripture. And so it's worth quoting her at some length out of her book. And so she writes this, no Jew then or now would have upheld any Sabbath ruling preventing work were a life in danger. Understand what she's saying? That, that no Jew then or now would understand, would, would, would take what Jesus did and assume that it was in violation of the Sabbath because he was saving a life. He was working on a life that was in danger. And that was allowed. Levi doesn't say it, but the number 18 in the story might be a signal for that woman's life. After, after 18 hard years that her life was now changing. And so you have to again look, go back in the scripture and look at what Jesus actually does. He calls the woman over and heals her by simply saying these words, woman, you are set free from your ailment. That's all he does. Now, we know that there are other scriptures in the Bible that specifically tell us of healing that Jesus had done when the person wasn't even near. We know that there is scripture in the Bible that tells us what you can do and what you cannot do on the Sabbath, or at least what you are supposed to be able to do and what you shouldn't do on the Sabbath. And it's, well, there's things like field labor and, and treading in a wine press and loading animals or, or doing business, traveling, kindling firewood are some of those things that are listed. And yet, 
over the centuries, and, and, and you really know this without really thinking about it, but over the centuries, there have always been discussions on what you can and cannot do or, or it should not do on the Sabbath. We remember the blue laws. Things that, that we just were not expected to do or couldn't do. And that's true for not only in Judaism, but Christianity. We know from the miracle stories in the New Testament, Jesus didn't have to be near people. You know, the fourth chapter, the Gospel of John, remember Roman nobleman's healed when his son is, is 20 miles away. So in this passage, passage of Luke, Jesus gives this woman her life back. Her life is restored and the people rejoice. And so Levine says the conclusion that we could draw from this really is this, that forbidding of the Sabbath work remains in place, but miracle working is permitted. But how do we apply this to us today? What is the message for us today? I mean, we, we read the scripture and we understand, you know, the woman that had this ailment for 18 years, Jesus sees the ailment, sees this woman in pain and agony. It's worth noting the woman hasn't asked for anything. The woman hasn't asked for anything. Jesus saw the problem. And Jesus was willing to do something about it. And so the question becomes, are you ready to fix what's broken? Because you can't fix it if you don't recognize that it's broken. You know, as Christians, we think about the story that, that we need to, to take away uh, something criticizing Judaism or, or looking at Judaism as a, a rigid, graceless religion set of rules. But what I want to suggest to you that this scripture is forcing you to look at your faith. To understand what your faith is calling you to do. Because Christianity is a faith of action. Christianity is a faith of doing something. And you remember the conflict that Paul and James had and and, and Paul says, you know, faith is, is something that's just given to us so that no one can boast. And James says, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but unless you do something with your faith, what good is it? I mean, that's, that's the question. What good is it if you don't do anything? So this scripture is a reminder for us, what are we going to do with our faith? El high, life. And how can we make life better for other people? We celebrate the fact that we call ourselves the hands and feet of Jesus, the heart of Christ in this world today. If any healing is needed, then we can and we should respond to that need. We should and can respond to be Christ to those people who need it. The Gospel of John, the 13th verse says, 
Jesus, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. You see, the goal in a Christian life is to love one another, to care for one another, not to hurt one another. And simply, the, the Christian theologians, uh, Misloff, Evolve, and Matthew Crossman, in a book called For the Life of the World, says we are all called to have a flourishing life. But not that we are all called to have that flourishing life. We are all called to make sure someone else has that flourishing life. To be there to help one another. That, that we're not called just to barrel through life on our own and worry about ourselves and, and be happy about our lot. But rather we are to breathe in this life that God has given to us and then look out into the world and see where we can make someone else's lot just a little bit better. And if we do that, if we do that, if we notice the story in Luke, if we notice the story in Luke, it's not that the woman asked for help. We need to look out into the world to notice where help is needed without those people asking for it. We need to reach out into the world. We need to take our blinders off to actually notice what is going wrong in the world and to be willing to do something about it. Because we can't fix it if we don't recognize that it is broken. And to recognize that it's just not individuals. That sometimes the system needs to be torn down and put back together again. What kind of system are we talking about? Well, if you don't or can't or won't recognize racism, we can't fix it. If you don't, can't, won't sexism, then we can't fix it. If you don't, won't, can't recognize homophobia, we can't fix it. If you don't, won't, can't recognize Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or educational inequality or economic inequality, those things exist in the world and we are called to fix it. We're called to do something about it. Each of us are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Environmental degradation. Our world is falling apart. And it's time that we recognize it and to try to do something about it. There's more to that list we could add, but you get the picture. We're called to be the hands and feet. Jesus acted without being asked. We are called to ask without being asked. To be willing to take the steps necessary. Maybe it's just a homeless person on the street. But how can we make that one life better? If only for a moment. How do we fix our health care system that shuts out so many people who need care? What are the things that we can do? How can we pay attention to the cries of the poor? How do we recognize the stranger in our midst? And how do we listen to them with empathetic ears? Because if we fail to do any of these things, if we fail to do any of them, we miss the opportunity to be God's hands and feet, to share God's grace, and to share God's healing power. We miss the chance 
to help others find a grateful, gracious, flourishing life. A life that God intends for everyone to have. The scripture is a scripture that tells us how Jesus was always alert to help others. And that we are now called to be that Christ. To be alert to the needs of others. The good news is this. That when we respond, when we help fix what needs fixing, we may hear an entire appreciative crowd expressing joy over what we've done. And you don't want to miss that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Stand as you are able and join in our hymn, This Little Light of Mine. shine you may be seated and at this time we have the opportunity to return to God a portion of the gifts that God has provided us I'd ask of our ushers to come forth to service
O God, who is most merciful and gracious, of whose bounty we have all received, accept these our offerings of your people. Remember in your love those who have brought it and those for whom it is given, and so follow it with your blessing, that it may promote, promote peace and goodwill among all peoples, advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Remain standing and sing our closing hymn, 110, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Go ahead and bring up the, the benediction and understand this. You know, this scripture is a scripture that reminds us that Jesus acted without being asked. He saw a need and he reacted to that need. We are called to act in this world. There is so much that needs to be done. We don't need to be asked to do something. If you see a place where you can help, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Join with me in our benediction. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and a crippled woman was healed. Jesus. Yes. After he touched her, she rose up and praised God. We depart today. May God set us free. May we leave the lives worthy of our Lord.
our calling, and may your grace be always upon our lips. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and every day. Go in peace, and the peace of God goes with you. Amen and amen. Amen.